Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us again here on Veteran Voices, and welcome to all you new listeners who are tuning in for the first time. Again, you get Veteran Voices, wherever you get your podcasts from. Uh, just quick programming note before we get started, because I have got an incredible veteran here in the wing uh, that I'm ready to interview. And Supply Chain Now is part of this family of programming with Veteran Voices. And today's episode in particular is in partnership with the Guam Human Rights Initiative, a nonprofit that's near and dear to my heart, and the Military Women's Collective. You can find more about the Guam Human Rights Initiative at guamhri.org and more about the Military Women's Collective at militarywomenscollective.org. And shout out to Marina Rabinek, my sister from another mister and Navy veteran. Uh, she's out there just crushing it every day, helping veterans across the country. So again, without further ado, uh, you're gonna tune in again with two veteran voices, but we got a veteran in the wing, uh, Matthew Brown here with us today from Chimney Trail. So I'm really excited to welcome you in Matthew. Mary Kay, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the invite. Yes, thank you. I know this is like a long time in, in the coming, in the making. And when I saw your episode with Mike Stedman, Iron Mike, I just had to have you on Veteran Voices as well. Uh, just really, really appreciative of the work that you're doing. I'm looking forward to diving deeper into that. But I love to kick off Veteran Voices with motivational quote. Or if you feel like gracing us with your voice, you are welcome to sing it. <laughs> do you have do you have a favorite quote of yours that you'd like to share? I I do. Um, so I this quote resonated with me early in life, but it really resonates with me now as an entrepreneur trying to balance like the demands of that with life and everything. Um, and I I actually said it at one of my very like one of my very best friends wedding uh and now it's like stuck in my head and it's this quote from Galileo Galilei and he said the sun with all those planets revolving around it and dependent upon it can still ripen a bunch of grapes as if it had nothing else in the universe to do and for some That's reason so poetic yeah it's like a it it really resonates with me because there are all of these things that you're having to balance and you're sort of maintaining all these orbits in your life. But how important is it to really focus on the things that matter and make sure it gets the the best version of you? And I, you know, whenever I think about that quote, I think about my wife, Jen, and my kids and and like the life that we're trying to build, even though we've got these other amazing things going on. Uh, anyway. No, Thanks I absolutely love that. <laughs> Yeah. And it definitely, I think, resonates and just encompasses you as, as a person. Because, again, you're just super easy to talk to. And our listeners don't even know that I've already been talking to you probably for like 45 minutes before <laughs> I even push record. Just because it's just like so easy to talk to you. And and I just absolutely love um, what you're doing uh, for the veteran community and just the, you know, just the American people in general. Um, so I, I would love to take our listeners a little bit back, and I'm not going to say way, way back because you're still young, uh, but we can talk about your upbringing and uh, where where did you grow up? Yeah, so I grew up in Southern Maryland, uh, Calvert County, which is about 30 minutes south of Annapolis. Um, so right along the Chesapeake Bay and my childhood was very water centric, which is sort of... Uh, hilarious because now I live uh, in Colorado in the mountains but yeah my earliest days were spent uh on the water Chesapeake Bay uh I played baseball I have uh, a younger sister she's two years younger than me I uh, grew up in a household with, with a mom and dad and in a really nice neighborhood so um I definitely benefited from a, a bit of a head start I'm conscious of the privileges that I grew up with um but yeah it was a, a wonderful uh childhood experience and went to high school at Northern High School and uh, my my introduction to all things military and sort of the start of my life's trajectory uh, right. was that was that high school Northern uh, because there was a, a man there named Captain James Minerline uh, who went to Annapolis and, and he was uh, in charge of the junior ROTC program and also the cross country team. And I did both of those things. And so he was a, a, a wonderful influence. In fact, probably my life's most important mentor. 
And oh, I absolutely love that. I, I also did uh, JRTC in high school and it was definitely a pivotal in the trajectory that I went as well. Um, but um, with regards to, to high school, was it something that you were, would you say, well-disciplined for the military at that time? Or were you still kind of that all over the place kid? <laughs> no, like I think early on, I had this, I say, I mean, I grew up not that far from Annapolis. And right. when I was in fourth grade, uh, we took a field trip to the Naval Academy with my teacher, Mrs. Kaler. And I remember going there and we saw noon meal formation, which for anybody that doesn't know about Annapolis's Ballyhoo, it's where we all parade out into the middle of Tecumseh Court, which is this big gathering place. Uh, and it's like a parade just to eat lunch. And so <laughs> we, uh, we did the, uh, we were there for this noon meal formation or this parade to go eat lunch. And I just remember everybody was in their whites and it was just really stately. Uh, and it, it was, you know, ultra patriotic. And even as like a nine-year-old, I was, I was quite uh, taken with the uh, like the story of America and history. And I had some great uh, history teachers early in life. Uh, and I, I just sort of fell in love with it. So in high school, knowing that Captain Minderline went to the Naval Academy. I I wouldn't say that I was like a particularly uh, disciplined. I wasn't disciplined in like a, a a strange way, but I knew that I wanted to go to Annapolis, so certain things I needed to accomplish, and so I just sort of did them as best I could. You know, and I think that that's important to note too with the academies being a well-rounded individual. So, like you said about like doing sports and doing JRTC. Uh, but I love the fact that you had a mentor so early on, because I, I think that just the idea concept of having a mentor is kind of is sort of lost until we hit adulthood and then we're sort of scrambling while we're adulting. Right. But I, I love that you you had him early on in life. I mean, it was transformational. Like I think about what my life would have been without that relationship and it would have been found like fundamentally different and and I mean, not to say that I would have, it would have been like bad or anything, you know, I'm sure that I would have figured out how to land on my feet in some way, but I've really had uh, a good ride. And I know that it started with him. Oh, I love that. Absolutely. And with regards to the Academy though, um, were you a direct appointment at the time? Was this like senior no, no, year? No, I, I, frankly, I think that uh, back to this mentorship thing, without Captain James Minerline, there's no midshipman Matt Brown, that's for sure. Like, I, I'm uh, almost positive uh, that his... Made some calls? Yeah, I mean, well, and, and he's, like, well-respected within the, the Naval Academy community, and I, and he, like, was up close and personal with, you know, various challenges that I experienced in life and that sort of thing. So he, like, he saw me as a human, not necessarily... Uh, like a a portfolio in the admissions office and and he would like see me operate every day and he'd be like yeah that, that's a person who needs to be a naval officer and and lead some people and and he took a chance on me and I'd like to think after these years that have gone by I've, I've made good on his investment um but yeah I, I was I went to preparatory school I went to Naval Academy's prep school first um and played a little bit of baseball there uh studied a lot um, and then went to the Naval Academy from there. Oh, great. And do you have sort of any anecdotes from your Academy days? Oh, my Please. gosh. <laughs> for, for, I know there's a ton that happens during that time, the Army-Navy game and everything. Yeah, no, I, so there are too many memories to, uh, let me just say it this way. Uh, the Naval Academy experience for me the like the education and the exposure to the different professors that we had and ultimately like graduating is certainly there's some value in that but the thing that has been of tremendous value for me is the people that I went through the experience with and they are the people that I lean on even as a as like a grown man with what I think is and ever evolving, but nevertheless, sort of like formed worldview and that sort of thing. Uh, I the roommates that I had at the Naval Academy and the, and the friends that I made while I'm there are a huge part of what sustains me uh, 
it, it makes me like a better dad, a better husband, all that sort of stuff. So the friendships is, is for sure. I, I, I'll just say this. Um, my company is named Chimney Trail. The reason it's named Chimney Trail uh, on paper is because the chimney is the archetypal cornerstone of the home. And if you're in a mental health uh, conundrum, it, we're like putting you on a trail to find your way back to the, the, that which is most important. And the, and the chimney sort of represents that. But the real reason that we're called Chimney Trail is because uh, during my time at the Naval Academy, I was in a room and we had seven roommates. There were seven of us in one room. Oh my and goodness. all of us, all seven, were like the worst midshipmen imaginable. And we were constantly getting in trouble. And whenever at the Naval Academy, if you have to, if if like one of your upperclassmen comes along and says, you have to do push-ups, that's called getting smoked. And one of us, 100% of the time was getting smoked. So the upperclassmen started calling our room the chimney because there was just always smoke in the chimney anyway. Oh so, my gosh. I love <laughs> the actual behind the scenes story. Yeah. This is like the real details. Yeah. Here. Getting the straight dope. Yeah. <laughs> Getting the inside scoop. <laughs> yeah. So I, I really, I love that aspect of it. And I know just before the recording, we were talking about to kind of get that feeling of sort of the, the lab rat feeling of tourists going to the Academy because anybody can go over and visit the Academy, but you get to see the midshipmen in their element in their little world and get a little bit of glimpse of that but it's definitely something that is so pivotal and it just shaping your mind at that time right and just really launching you into into this career and i i really want to know if, like the the aspect on mental health is that something that you discovered early on at the academy or was this like coming out uh once you commissioned so the mental health um, for anybody that doesn't know, Chimney Trail is a mental health care company. I started it five years ago, um, and the and the genesis event for the company was that I was finishing up a command tour uh, of one of our mine countermeasure ships in San Diego, and I had just checked in to my new job with the, the SEAL teams doing some innovation work for them. Uh, but then I got a phone call a few months into that tour, and our very best young officer uh, had gone to a Marine Corps exchange and he bought a, a nine millimeter and he took his own life. And I went to the hospital to sit with his parents because uh, his parents had flown all the way from India. Uh, he was first generation American, but his dad uh, kept bringing up this team building exercise that we did where uh, we went to Yosemite together to climb Cathedral Peaks. This was on the ship. All of the officers and chiefs went to Yosemite to climb Cathedral Peaks together. And his dad kept talking about how his son would brag about that trip and, and was so inspired by it. And then he grabbed me by the shoulders and he's like, why didn't I do these things with my son? Why didn't I do these things with my beautiful son? And I feel like I had other mental health related exposure earlier in life. Like there were other instances uh, for example, like I grew up with a mom and aunt who wrestled with mental health challenges all their own. I have a, a younger cousin who became addicted to opioids and took his own life. Um, I I just had like exposure to this uh, field. Uh, and but that event, I thought my my trajectory was going to be in the Navy for a long time. But that event sort of was like the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. And on my drive home from the hospital, I called my wife, Jen, and I just said, hey, I know we were talking about a Navy career, but I think maybe we need to consider starting a mental health care company to address this challenge with our veterans. And then frankly, to address the challenge for everyone, because um, I mean, the Surgeon General has just came out today and said that adolescent mental health is the number one health crisis of our time. So, uh, I just figured it was time to do something about it. No, I I love that you, even though I, I say that I love that you are doing the work that you're doing and then it sort of stemmed from that. Um, it's also unfortunate, right, that we have to go through these experiences or to that we know folks that are near and dear to us that have, have taken their own life or who have gone through such deep thoughts in their mind that they can't find a way out and they find that permanent solution and I think that this is something that we may not eradicate anytime soon, but you've sort of found, you've created 
that pathway, like you said, the trail uh, that you're continuing to help others out there and, and not just for the military, but you know, when I was hearing more about chimney trail that you're actually doing this for others as well. And, and for the youth. And this is just like you said, here's a father who's lost his son. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just like another shipmate. wasn't just another a veteran service member. This is somebody, you know, father to son in that relationship and, and him having those regrets that he wished, why didn't I do this with my beautiful son? But I think just that the story, the origin story of Tuny Trail is really beautiful and I really admire the work that you're doing now. Um, and I would love to hear a little bit about uh, as far as where you have been able to touch folks while you're in service. So this is like when you were still serving, um, Chimney Trail came to be like the idea that you wanted to do something, right? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, we. so I, I want to make sure I understand your question right. You're saying, you're asking like, while I was still in uniform, what were yeah, we doing? Yeah, while you're still in uniform, were you able to, was was this just kind of an idea you want, or like, I wanted to do more. I want to do something. I need to do something. No, I mean, I, it was one of those moments where, I mean, I think most veterans along their military career, I, I had a command master chief one time who had a really great way of putting it. He was like, hey, I always want you to have a plan for staying in and a plan for getting out. It, it, it was just like, just always have both of those plans in place because you never know when you might need to do one or the other. And so I was at one of those points where it was like, okay, I just had a wonderful experience as the captain of this ship and it was an early command tour so i got to uh experience command as an 04 which is pretty awesome and so i was thinking well i might need to you know i like the navy certainly has a path for me and it would be an amazing adventure but after this experience and reflecting on it and having my own previous like family related experiences it, it, i didn't really stick around the active duty navy to try to fix it from inside the lifelines because I, I knew that, uh, well, I'll, I'll just tell you the, the reason is because I knew that in order to communicate the types of lessons that we were trying to communicate to our troops, I needed to be a commercially viable entity, not another Navy program. And so well, that, there... I, I love that you said you wanted to do something different, not just be another, because I, I think we too often get that check in the box. And these are kind of our left and right limits. This program was pre-approved, it was pre-paid for, and this is what's going to get pushed out to everybody right across the board. And that's why I love like how you created something unique here. Yeah, that, that was the idea. It was, it, it, there's just an, I think a very appropriate cynicism that our military sort of carries around with it when it comes to new programs to address major problems like this. And it's like, uh, my co-founder, Brad Markey, is a professional baseball player. And his he always says, we want our service members and veterans to feel like a sponsored athlete rather than like just eating off the menu of a government program. And so we knew that in order to achieve that, I needed to part ways with active duty like found a proper mental health care company and, you know, essentially leverage the tools of commerce to, to make it happen. No. And I think that I, I love that you've also brought in experts. I think so often when we get like this good idea, we become the good idea fairy and we kind of just want to go for it. But I think that you also recognize that you didn't know everything there was to know about even tackling this. Right. But you, you came up and you created this uh, a platform to bring in subject matter experts and others that really have the heart and passion to do this. So I, I've already seen that you've created a, an incredible team uh, as sort of a powerhouse <laughs> and uh, to, to help you build this. Yeah, I mean, th that was out of necessity because I don't know anything about this stuff. It's like, I don't, I mean, I have experience in like a very raw sort of way uh, with suicide, mental health challenges, that sort of thing. But I don't, I didn't know any of the psychology or any of the medicine behind it. Um, and frankly, as I was departing active duty, I didn't even know like what the solution was going to be because it's such a, um, Dr. Craig Bryan, he works out of Ohio State's uh, Wexner Institute and he does a lot, a lot of research into uh, suicide prevention. He always calls it a wicked problem 
because suicide and, and pathological uh, anxiety and depression have so many factors that that trying to predict it is more like trying to forecast the weather than it is something that you could fix with a reductionist methodology. So we didn't even know what the answer was going to be. And so we just asked as many experts as we could find. We said, what is the stuff that you have at your disposal right now that you know for a fact works? And all of them came back to us and said that cognitive behavioral therapy, if more people knew about it and more people knew about the cognitive distortions that lead to anxiety and depression, that that we would be able to like make a real dent in the in the mental health and suicide crisis that we're in the middle of right now. And so then after we discovered that, it was just figuring out how do we make it so that everybody can gain access to it and learn it without having to schedule an appointment with a doctor, because there will always be more people in need than there are clinicians who can see them. And it's, and like you said, yes, the, the, the fact with the VA keeps coming out, right, is that we're still like understaffed and they continues, those kind of policies and the, the, the funding that's available continues to change. But the number of veterans who are needing those services is not it, like if anything, it's going up or more feeling comfortable enough to at least come forward and say that they have a problem and they need help. Uh, but we're not keeping up with that demand uh, for resources. Uh, so I was, I was wondering, I, you know, a little bit earlier showed a little bit of the, the box. I'd love if you could share uh, the chimney trail kit. Uh, with us, I know our listeners uh, who are just tuning and listening will be able to see it, but if they tune in through video, they'll be able to. Yeah, yeah, this is this is my favorite part of the job. So um, people are like, oh, hey, you put cognitive behavioral therapy in a box to teach people about these 10 cognitive distortions that lead to anxiety and depression. And the answer to that is yes. Um, and so th what what comes in a kit? And so this is what a chimney trail waypoint kit looks like. The, the boxes sometimes are different shapes depending on what is in it. But we had a couple of challenges. We needed to make it so that people would want to open the box. So the first thing that we did was we decided that the type of curriculum that we were going to put forward, we knew that if we want it to stick in someone's brain, like Ben Franklin has this great quote. It's like, if you want me to forget, tell me. If you want me to maybe remember, then teach me. If you want me to actually remember, involve me. So we decided to take cognitive behavioral therapy and involve the person in the, like in training them on these distortions. And so as you open up the kit, there is a little book. And with this particular kit, we're gonna build a time capsule together. And so inside is everything you need to build a time capsule. There's like a entrenching That's tool. So cool. Uh, stainless steel, like time capsule. There's some waterproof paper. It's like a write in the rain notebook and then a waterproof like space pen. And you might be like, what does building a time capsule have to do with mental health? Uh, but it's actually very important. So not necessarily building a time capsule, but doing an activity outdoors together because doing an outdoor activity together opens up your brain to accept an indelible memory. And the memory that we're going to talk about in this waypoint, we're going to learn about what cognitive distortions are and how to break the cycle of distortions. And then with this specific kit, we're going to address something called discounting the facts. Sometimes that's called discounting the positive. Uh, and it's where you are like filtering out all of the positive things in your life and focusing on the negative. But you can see that with, with other kits, we might address late or should statements or emotional reasoning or magnification or jumping to conclusions or any of the other 10 cognitive distortions. And so as you go through the book, it teaches you about discounting the facts and how to overcome it. It tells you what's inside the kit. And then it steps you through like how to do the kit in a way that is going to build resilience and mental health in you or your family. Uh, and then at the end of the book, there is a little like reflection exercise so that you can take what you just learned and apply it to various things that you're going through in your own life. And so there's a, a, a column here that talks about, okay, some negative thoughts that I've had, what distortion might I be suffering from? And then how do I reframe those thoughts? And the science is like, like the research is in. And if you're able to master these distortions and, and like figure out how to reframe your thinking, 
then you will not suffer from pathological levels of anxiety and depression and you will wake up just damn excited about the day like ready to go and that's that's a waypoint kit oh i this is so cool so like for our listeners who are only tuning in by audio you definitely got to check out video uh, to see the chimney trail but then always i also checked out on the website too that you also have uh some of the sample pictures of the kit as well but i remember even as a as a kid i i buried a time capsule and i just thought that was the coolest thing and just like little knickknack things and i remember just seeing later when my dad was like i need this stuff out of my house um so i remember like looking and i'm like what's this penny from i don't remember or it's like a random raffle ticket and i'm like i don't remember what that's from but it's like the stuff you do is just really cool and and what a, a treasure thing to do uh with your loved ones so i think that's fantastic and, it, and it's so interactive and again that connection of being able to bring like the youth uh, with the, and the parent to child is a uh, relationship's really cool. Yeah. So. so certainly our initial research for this was very pediatric focused because we knew that I don't know how much luck you've had changing adults, but it's way easier to change the mind of a kid. So we were initially focused on kids, but then we discovered that the research is every bit as applicable for uh, adults. And so we're partnering with the Marines right now and we're trying to get uh, a program set up where we introduce cognitive behavioral therapy to our Marines at boot camp, and we give them this time capsule waypoint kit as they graduate from boot camp. And then for their first year of service, winter, spring, summer, and fall, we give them a new kit. But each of the waypoint kits is going to address two cognitive distortions. So total, they will cycle through all 10 distortions. And then we want to reintroduce the curriculum with different activities every time that the Marine does a permanent change of duty station and then do it one last time as they transition out of service. And we're, we want to, we want to like get to doing that as fast as we can, because the uh, secretary of defense commissioned a suicide prevention and response independent review committee to analyze suicide prevention in the armed forces. And one of their findings was that, across, it doesn't matter your rank, your service, your uh, duty station, no matter where you were or who you were, you essentially thought that the suicide prevention training that existed in the military currently was a gigantic waste of time. They, they like 100%, even admirals and generals, they were like sitting in front of a computer and cycling through slides is not going to help me to manage like behavioral health issues notice. or overcome mental health issues. So and, yeah, and I think our listeners like who whether you served or didn't, you know that power, like we call it death by PowerPoint, but we know that the PowerPoint or clicking through it is not solving the problem. And even though they attempt to just bring us all into a room and like let's have a conversation about it, there's still a huge stigma with around mental health, right? And I still have buddies that are they they can't sleep, they're they've got nightmares. And even if I was like do you, you know, this is available to you, you want this resource, they don't want it. Even if it's like already paid for, they don't, they don't want to seek it. They really think it's going to impact their professional careers and uh, their military service. So, you know, just what, it, what's been some of the kind of the, the talking points that you have to get folks to, to want to get on the trail, so to speak, and a path towards, towards healing. Well, so firstly, the reason that we made it commercially sophisticated is because we want it, like Riley always says, he wants people to feel like a sponsored athlete, not just like they're getting socked with some training that they hate, you know? Right. So, so we wanted to make it commercially sophisticated so that people receive it and they're like, wow, the armed forces cares about me. Like, this is an amazing product. And these are things that I'll actually use and enjoy in other parts of my life. This is like a quality thing. So the quality was number one. I think if you get the quality right, people will automatically want to participate. Um, the second thing is that we're not exclusive to the military. Like we're working really hard to establish relationships with professional sports organizations, with investment banks, with like big four accounting firms, major defense contractors. So there are other people who are providing us input so that we're constantly improving the product. And the, the third thing is that we're trying to get the best uh, and right now we have the best and we're continuing to build our ranks of, of uh, clinical talent so that we're not selling like some snake oil. There are so many disingenuous actors 
in the mental health care space. And we want to make sure that we're like a, a pillar of integrity. Uh, and so we're just making sure that anything that we put out, we're not like over promising. We're not doing any of that stuff. We're just focused on delivering the most quality product that we can and one that we know will move the needle. Um, and and that, that's really the sales pitch. We don't really, there, there's no more to it than just creating the best damn product that we can make. No, <laughs> period. End of sentence. Yes, mic drop. Um, but I honestly think that's fantastic. And like you said, to not just create the, the snake holder and those uh, malign actors out there that are just trying to slap a price tag on a false product, but something that's, that is genuine. You do have the experts that are putting their stamp of approval on this. And like I said before, I love that you've also created this community that's across different industries, it's across a threshold. Um, you know, we talk about a lot on Veteran Voices about transition and transitioning service members, but we also realize that for athletes, especially professional athletes, they go through transition as well. And, it, you know, we find this like just naturally as human beings want this sense of purpose and sense of belonging. And then when we lose that piece of our identity, whether it's we retire, we transition, we get injured and we can't do the job anymore, um, that does take a mental health toll. So I do love that you've opened it up to everybody. Absolutely. And I mean, it's not even like a choice for me because Brad is a ball player. So he like <laughs> so every, every spring, like the smell of grass clippings will get his like, Hey, I'm supposed to be throwing hundred mile an hour fastballs right now. Like what, right. what am I doing? You know? So, uh, we benefit from our own product. Like it's really hilarious. Actually. We, now that we're so familiar with these 10 cognitive distortions, we'll be having company meetings and I'll, I'll be like, we, we need to be doing this. We need to be doing that. And people are like, you're suffering from the should statement cognitive distortion right now. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta throw up, drop some big words in there. Yeah. Yeah. The PhD level. But no, I think that's fantastic. And, you know, just, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Cause as, as someone who did go through a transition, um, like what sort of advice would you give to those who are in tra transition now? And I guess we could even open this up beyond transitioning service members, but just anybody that's going through a transition, like, do you have, any advice that you'd like to, to lend? Yes. Uh, gosh, these are tough questions because it it's a lot to look like you know what you're talking about. And I do not know what I'm talking about in this space. Um, I, I'll, just, I'll just give you my experience. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a reason. First, we'll talk to the veteran community. There is a reason that you joined the service to begin with. Now, it could have been, I want my school paid for. I want a skill that's transferable to the outside. It could have been like something economical, but there are a lot of other ways that you could have achieved some sort of economic advantage early in life. But you ultimately decided to serve an organization that on raising your right hand and swearing an oath to defend the Constitution you knew that you were stepping off on something that was way bigger than you and, and you were okay with that. So deep in your DNA or your psyche, there was this desire to serve. And I think that in transitions from military careers to market-based careers or any other sort of career, there is what you just described, Mary-Kate, which is this, this risk of losing a sense of purpose. Yes, And so- what I think my my number one advice, piece of advice, whatever the right way of saying that is, would be to get small when you are transitioning. And instead of thinking about this like existential purpose in life, instead, think about your purpose today, because it's impossible. Like in the military, you get accustomed to this very hierarchical structure where you're able to sort of predict what it is that you're going to be doing next. But as you transition, the opportunities are going to be so vast and so amazing that it's easy to become overwhelmed and you get paralyzed. So instead of thinking about like this hierarchical journey that you've sort of been trained to imagine, instead, just focus on your individual day. Like today, my purpose is to do what? And like when I was first going through this, it was to get up in the morning at the same time, go to sleep at the same time, exercise, eat a, a healthy diet, like, you know, hug my wife every day, kiss my children every day to make sure that uh, like I was appreciating the fact that 
unlike my previous job in this job, I could like be around my family, like it, it, getting small will allow you to focus on the right things. And if you string enough good days together, then your opportunities, like you get to, the world is your oyster. So maybe just like shrink your, your like focus area for just a little while. Does that make sense? It does. And I was like, oh my goodness, they're going to pull so many golden nuggets from this episode. I'm like uh, dropping so many great quotes here, but I love about keeping it small because you brought up something that's so important. It's the family component of just like taking that time to hug your family, hug your loved ones, because they're also going through this transition period with you. And they were there through all the times away or while you were out there uh, achieving and, and going after your dreams. And they, it, it's so easy to take them for granted, right? So uh, just taking that time and you keep it small to uh, remember the family piece in there as well. Um, and, and I love that piece, you know, I, and I say this often in the in Veteran Voices about not being alone. And, you know, it's not like not everybody's going to understand where you're at and that point of life, but there is somebody out there who's likely gone through something very similar to what you have. So I think just really important, the storytelling piece to be able to to share your journey, your story out loud and like what you're going through um, so that others can can jump in and provide perspective. And I love that perspective that you offered. So I feel like, you know, maybe drop some like additional quotes there in the chimney trail boxes because you got your full, full dropping some wisdom in there. Um, yeah. So, so um, but I, I was wondering now just to, to segue into what our listeners, what our audience of Veteran Voices, Supply Chain Now and across the board can do to help Chimney Trail. Uh, is there there's something out there that some way that we can help or anybody who wants to get involved to support what you're doing? Yeah. So if you want to get involved, my email address is Matthew at ChimneyTrail.com. So Matthew with two T's at ChimneyTrail.com. And I, I will happily stop what I'm doing and answer any email to, to anybody that um, is interested in helping in some way, whatever that way might be. People are way more creative than me, so they'll come up with something awesome. Uh, the second thing I'll say is if you are um, listening to this podcast and you are going through a tough time and like you would benefit from some mental health resources, um, please like send me an email or uh, like reach out to the so many resources that are available right now. In fact, if you Google, I'm having a tough time with my mental health, uh, or if you have like the word suicide, if you Google it, a, a million resources will pop up on Google and and please do that because uh, you're worth it. And e even if you, right now you don't feel like you are, um, you are like the probability of being born is so remote that it's like, you're statistically worth it, even if you don't feel like you are right now. So the so that's the second thing. Uh, and then the third would be, I'd be a pretty crummy businessman if I didn't just say, if you are working for a company that has an existing corporate wellness program, we're putting together curriculums for companies right now. Um, it's basically the same stuff that we're doing for the Marines, except we can do it for your company uh, and, and maybe fine tune it so that it speaks to the challenges that you might experience like if you're a Marine, you might be experiencing, okay, what's close close combat like? Well, if you're in the corporate world, you might be the salesperson that's getting turned down 7,000 times a day and that wears on your mental health. So we can uh, fine tune it for your company. But if you have if you work for a place that has a corporate wellness program, uh, don't just tell them about Chimney Trail, like demand that your company implement it because I promise you it will be good for the bottom line of your company and you will have a wonderful corporate culture as a result. Um, it touches on a lot of things. It's not just suicide prevention. Uh, overcoming the cognitive distortions that cause anxiety and depression also helps with things like sexism, racism, ageism, all the stuff that deteriorate a good corporate culture, and we can fix it. And we're proud to be of service. So, uh, so that's my pitch. No, I love that. And I mean, I don't know if it goes beyond the pitch. This is like stuff that it's tangible. Anybody can take part in it. Just even that conversation or like as they, they try to do with their training in the military is just even asking, are you 
planning to hurt yourself? Are you wanting, are you having those thoughts so that you can intervene? And I know this is a topic that's very real uh, for me, who's still serving in the reserve capacity, but that I, I have a soldier who recently was having those thoughts and to just be able to say, here's these resources, but to even have her get to the point where she was willing and, and ready to tell us and to say, I need help. So I think just even being able to educate uh, yourself, you know, for our listeners to educate yourselves on what to do, what resources are available so that if that circumstance ever happens where you end up in a situation and someone ends up opening up to you, that you, you know what to do. And Matthew, I just love what you're doing at Chimney Trail, what your team is doing. Uh, you continue to assemble an, assemble an army. <laughs> I'm biased to mention there, but you're creating an army across the country that's helping you. Um, was there any last, uh, you know, parting thoughts that you have for our listeners today? Just, I, I, if you could drop again, just uh, what your website is and, and how they can get a hold of you, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, the website is www.chimneytrail.com. Uh, chimney, just like what smoke comes out of and trail, just like what you walk down. Uh, and then my personal email address is Matthew at chimneytrail.com. Uh, we'd love to hear from everybody. But my, my parting thought is uh, just to say uh, thank you, Mary Kate. I know that you have so many potential guests or opportunities to interview different people that are trying to make an impact in some way or another. Uh, and I'm so grateful that you are leaning in on the preservation of our forces mental health. Um, it's sort of like the not so secret secret that if we can't crack this problem, uh, it starts to deter deteriorate our all volunteer force. So there's a very strategic yes. imperative to get it solved. And I appreciate your seriousness in the space and for carving out time to talk with me today. Absolutely. Well, when I tuned into a live uh, interview with you and, and Iron Mike Stedman, I knew I just had to get you here on Veteran Voices. But uh, for our listeners, like you'll see, you may see uh, Matthew up on the hill occasionally in a suit and tie out there, you know, knocking on Congress's door and just really appreciate what you're doing to, to be that voice and be that mouthpiece because not everyone out there who's struggling is ready to face those demons head on. And, it, you know, it's just great that you can be that that beacon of hope and to be able to fight for them on the hill uh, to get some things changed and get things moving. Uh, so not everybody takes that time. Some folks are, you know, all the talk and they're not doing the walk. So again, Thank you for being on here. For our listeners, tune in to Chimney Trail. Uh, Matthew Brown, connect with him. You have to follow his journey on LinkedIn and learn more about what they're doing and what his team is doing uh, with Chimney Trail. Just grateful to all our listeners, past and present, for tuning in to Veteran Voices. Thank you. You can tune in, and hopefully we'll see you in future episodes wherever you get your podcasts from. And again, thank you to our our sponsors, we got Guam Human Rights Initiative with our partners and Military Women's Collective at militarywomenscollective.org. Um, thank you to Supply Chain Now, uh, which is our part of our family of programming. We're so grateful. So I encourage all of you to continue to do good and be the change that's needed. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.